Good morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever the case may be. I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, also with Carleton University, Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. Today I'm going to talk about methane, specifically methane that is coming up from the seafloor sediments on the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. Recently, a friend of mine, Nick Breeze, who has this website, Envisionation, did an interview with Natalia Shikova and uh, Igor Similitov on the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf work that they've done, and they published a paper recently. So I'll get right to it. In this particular um, video, I'm going to concentrate more on the interview um, by Nick Breeze. So we're talking about subsea permafrost on the East Siberian Arctic Shelf and it's an accelerated decline. So this paper that just came out is in Nature Communications Journal. It's open, open access, open source, so you can see the paper here. Now notice it was first received July 2016, accepted May this year, published 22nd of June. It took almost a full year to get published. Now this has to be in the scientific literature for two years before it's even considered by the IPCC. So that would be June of 2019. Um, I don't know when the next IPCC AR6 is going to come out, but AR5 came out in 2013. So if this one's in 2020, the next one, this paper probably won't even make it into there, which is why the IPCC process is flawed. We need to have updates every year on what is going on. So getting back to this paper, it shows mechanisms for the destabilization of subsea permafrost. So it provides insights into increased emissions from these, this uh, shelf, the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, ESAS, has the world's largest deposits of methane. Now, the permafrost, that's embedded in the seafloor has acted as a seal for thousands of years, restricting the flow of gas like methane through the sediments into the water column into the atmosphere. But the permafrost is degrading and there's gas migration pathways that are occurring and re resulting in the emissions that we're seeing. So in order to predict climate change, and specifically temperatures in the Arctic, we need to know near future methane releases, how much methane is coming out. Okay, so the decay, um, what the paper is showing significantly is even permafrost that was only um, formed, for, that was only submerged relatively recently, less than a thousand years ago, is currently thawing and releasing methane. And there's no force that we know of that can stop this trend of further decay and increased emissions as the Arctic continues to warm. So this is the North Pole. This is looking down. This is a polar view from the Russian side. Okay, uh, Greenland's up here. So this is the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. The East Siberian Sea, the Chukchi Sea. And let's have another couple views of this. So if you Google polar data, okay, this is an interesting website here. Uh, just polar data. Okay, all these different maps of the Arctic. Okay, showing various things. This is the bathymetry, um, different um, navigation pathways, etc. And this is interesting. This is showing the forming of snow cover on the land, and then the loss, loss of snow cover and the greening of the vegetation on a, on, a season, on, on a yearly basis going through time. But this is what I want to focus on here. This is the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. Average depth about 50 meters. And then, um, so there's these continental shelves all around the Arctic. And uh, if we go down, this is the circulation patterns of the water. So you can see things like the Beaufort Gyre, transpolar drift, um, and then the ocean currents carrying warm water that come in underneath the ice. 
and that'll be very important. Um, there's lots of other interesting maps on here. This is the seafloor features map, the bathymetry. So what you can see again is the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, and there's many other continental shelves. Okay, so this is the area that we're focusing on. So just to give you an idea of the size, I want to show you, um, this is the seasonal variation of the Arctic sea ice extent. So it maxes out at about 15 million um, square kilometers. And the minimum, the new record in 2012 was about, was just over 3 million square kilometers. Okay, so keep those numbers in mind. That's sort of the range. The previous record before 2012 was 2016 and 2007, and that was more like 4 million square kilometers. Okay, so how big is this shelf? It's the largest and shallowest shelf, mean depth of 50 meters. The area is 2 million square kilometers. Okay, so this is a large area compared to the total area. Um, of the Arctic. So the seabed has frozen organic matter, basically subsea permafrost. Permafrost is ground that remains less than or equal to zero degrees Celsius for two or more years. Okay, so why is it there? It started developing when the Northern Hemisphere cooled around two and a half million years ago. So it was above sea level. There was, the atmosphere got very, very cold. The, um, so that there was a lot of glacier, a lot of water turned into ice, which went on continents. So sea levels dropped. So this area was 50 meters below the sea now today, but it was much, much higher than the sea level back then for a long period of time. So the, the, the permafrost was formed. Eventually, as the glaciers melted, sea level rose, submerging the permafrost. So that goes, the inundation of the shelf with seawater, it changed the properties because it increased the temperature as much as 17 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you have seawater just above freezing, covering the permafrost versus the uh, temperatures of the permafrost before, which were about minus 17 or colder degrees Celsius. Now, the last interglacial peaked about 21,000 years ago. Um, and uh, after that, ice started melting at that point at the peak last in, peak of the last interglacial or sorry the last glacial maximum the LGM the last glacial maximum was about 21,000 years ago sea levels were 120 to 130 meters lower than today so this shelf with an average depth now of 50 meters had a, had an average elevation above sea level of 70 to 80 meters so it was very cold and the permafrost was was um, strengthened and then the entire shelf area the sea level started rising up and there were numerous thaw lakes on the on, on the terrain um, underlain by talix which is unfrozen permafrost okay so let me just have a look here okay so this is to give you an idea um, this is what the methane clathrates look like You've got water molecules that are frozen around a methane molecule. When the, it, it, and, and this stuff will be stable when the pressure is high enough and the temperature is low enough. When you raise the temperature or relieve the pressure, the ice around starts melting. The, the, whole, mol, the whole structure expands 160 times, roughly, and you get methane gas. Okay, so this is down here in these uh, clathrate mounds on the seafloor, there's methane seeps, and there's clathrates up here, and so on. Okay, so the, why does this stuff form, these, these methane uh, clathrates? Well, on the land, okay, um, there's a geothermal gradient. You get heat from the earth, so it's hotter as you're deeper. And that temp as you get closer to the surface in the Arctic, the temperature goes closer and closer to the air temperature. And there's a hydrate gas phase boundary. So all this area in between is where you can have methane hydrate being in stable form. This is permafrost on ground. So take the permafrost on ground and suddenly inundate it with water above. And you have all of this hydrate here, which is not very far down 
under the water. Okay, if you, in the ocean here, you know, if the ocean floor is, 12, is 1,200 um, meters deep, then this is the water temperature, the red line, this is the hydrate gas boundary. And so the hydrates would only be, of course, they can't be existing free floating. They're, they, they're, they're, they're buoyant, they would rise to the top. So in the seafloor, you get these hydrates here. This is the geothermal gradient. So, you, so it's too hot down below them. Above them, it's cold enough. So you get the hydrates in this region. So if you track this temperature curve and the gas phase curve, you come here. They meet here, which is call it, uh, it's about 280 meter water depth or 300 meters, call it. So at 300 meters of water depth, the pressure and temperature in the ocean is sufficient to have hydrates on the seafloor. Okay, uh, not in the sediments, but sitting on the seafloor. So let's have a look now how that relates to the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf. Okay, so, so basically the Eastern Siberian Arctic Shelf, the analogy is it's like, um, it's like a, a bottle of champagne with a cork bottle. Okay, there's gases that are in the sediment but as long as you have a cork on the bottle, or as long as you have permafrost in the sediments and the gas is confined, it keeps accumulating, the pressure rises, but the cork or the subsea permafrost is a lid and it keeps the methane in the shelf. It was thought that that lid would be stable for a long period of time, okay? Just be before it was permafrost on land and then it was submerged, now it becomes subsea permafrost and there's an impermeable lid, there's nothing to worry about, okay? But when that lid starts losing its stability, um, when it starts to thaw, then the methane can be released. And the amounts of methane that are currently being released make us think that the permafrost is disintegrating and that paper, um, which I'll talk about in a separate video, talks about the rates of degradation of the permafrost over time. Now, the thing is, is the paper looked at it over a 30-year time period because there were some drill cores from the early 80s. Um, so the question, what question Nick was asking is, okay, it's three decades, you know, how are these changes conclusive? So the thing is, is there, there's, as soon as the continental shelf was inundated with water, seawater, that started, that brought the temperature up about 17 degrees Celsius and started the natural warming of the, of the uh, subsea permafrost. But of course, and that, that started say 5,000 years ago when, the, when uh, the sea level was high enough to overcome the, uh, the uh, to cover the, the, the Eastern Siberian Arctic shelf coast. So the permafrost started degrading, but you know, many people, many scientists suggested that it would keep its integrity for millennia. But areas that are near the coastline that were only submerged in less than a thousand years ago um, are releasing hydrates and releasing methane. So this means that the permafrost has thawed already in those regions, which is much less than this, this thousand years. Um, so we have to add the natural warming to the um, anthropogenic warming, and together they're accelerating the pace of natural processes. Okay, so, so we need to talk, okay, so the interglacials are periods between ice ages, and the permafrost starts to thin due to the warming, okay, but in previous interglacials like the Eemian, for example, the temperature was higher, and the, the methane hydrates were not all, all release, that should say. I mean, some of them would be released if they were up closer to the surface, but lots of them were not released. And the thing is that in the Eemian, 130,000 to 115,000 years ago, temperatures were higher, you know, but the duration during which they were higher was short, about 2,000 years. And then there was cooling. In the Holocene, it's been 5,000 years of warming um, since the inundation has covered the, the shelf. So I'm going to have to stop here and continue this in a second part video. Thank you for listening.